right into week two now of enter to win. Now, I know in this day, when I, when I was growing up and I played sports, I did not get a prize unless I participated. Y'all see where I'm going with this? Yes. Okay, because today, unfortunately today, our children are being taught that all you have to do is show up and you'll get a prize. All you got to do is arrive to get the prize. That's not biblical and that's not ethical and it's definitely not the thing that we want to teach our children because if you don't participate, see here's what's happened because we've become so soft. I'm going to preach to somebody today. Because we've become so soft that we want to give these kids, and listen, I'm all about children. I love children. But listen, if you don't earn it, if you're not teaching them that they need to earn their prizes and not just give them to them just for showing up, then you make you teach them uh, that they don't need to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, uh, and here's what's happened. By doing that, Here's what's happening to the children, to this generation, not everybody, of course, but to, for the majority that I see, what's happening when we just give prizes for showing up, then you're taking away the honor and the privilege to even be able to play. And what's happening, we're seeing that in churches, we're seeing that in marriages, people have lost respect and honor for the privilege to be able to participate even in marriage. That's right. We've lost the honor, we've lost the respect of all that because we're creating snowflake. Now listen, I don't listen. I'm not trying to get into anybody's business, but I'm just telling you, we have gotten so soft that we're so easily offended by everything that everybody says and does that we're afraid to even come out of the house. we got to be tougher than that. If we're going to be God's people, we have to toughen up and not be so easily offended. Yes. So what we're teaching our children, unfortunately, we're teaching them that just show up. And when you do that, you'll get a prize. Listen, I appreciate everybody being here, but if you didn't get your tickets, you ain't going to win nothing. <laughs> All right? I'm just telling us what I'm trying to tell you. At least get a ticket. Just like the guy playing, the, you know, he, he's sitting by the, on every Friday night, every Tuesday night, Saturday, whenever they have lottery, he's sitting at his house and he's looking at the numbers. Oh, man, I didn't win. Come on, I want to win. I want to win. And he's looking at the numbers every single time they have a lottery draw. He's looking at the numbers and he's hoping and praying and, and wishing he's going to win. He's going to win. And finally one day, after years of this, he prayed to God. He said, God, why can't I win the lottery? And God said, because you haven't bought a ticket. <laughs> we want something for nothing, don't we? We don't want to invest even in our own lives sometimes. But if we don't invest, there's no return. Don't expect anything if you're not going to invest something in it. Matter of fact, one of the greatest heroes in my heroes in the Bible was David. And he said, don't give me anything that doesn't cost me something. He wanted to pay. Listen, he, we have gotten so the entitlement free giveaway society that we just want everything given to us and we don't want to have to do anything. Try doing that on your job and see how many paychecks you get. <laughs> Try doing that on your job and I'm just going to arrive, show up, and they're going to give me my paycheck. Mm. How's that going to work out for you? Yeah. I'm telling you, we, we've just gotten so off track with this stuff and and I wrote this down as God gave it to me this morning about 5.30 as I was studying. No participation produces no appreciation. Mm -hmm. If you don't participate, you'll get to the point that you don't appreciate even what you do have. Wow. So if we're going to participate in this thing called life, then we need to participate and invest in our own life, in our own blessings, in our own things that we expect come to us. We've got to participate in this. Now, David, he was a man after God's own heart. And we're going to go somewhere with this. I just don't know exactly where, but I'm trying to go somewhere. So David was a man after God's own heart. Now, David didn't mind getting in a battle. I mean, he'd jump in a battle in the Israelite minute, man. He didn't care. He just jumped. You know David defeated the giant called Goliath? He defeated a giant for one nation. But he could not feat, defeat the giant within the nation because they were ungrateful. Mm -hmm. That's why they didn't go into the promised land. Right. Because they were not appreciative for the God that kept saving them and feeding them and parting the waters and continuing to take care of them for 40 years. But they still were not grateful. 
And they didn't want to participate. They just wanted God just to drop it out of heaven. We're hungry and we're starving and we're thirsty. We ought to die. We should have died in Egypt. That's ungratefulness. They didn't want to participate in their own life, in their own future. They just wanted God just to keep handing things to them and handing things to them. The subtitle of this message, the title is Enter to Win. The subtitle is Ensuring Your Entrance. Are you sure that you're going to walk into the promises of God? Carolyn had no idea what I was going to be speaking about today, but a while ago she said, all of God's promises are yes and amen. And they are. But for us to enter into those promises, there's something we need to be doing to enter into those promises. Now, I'm going to show you that today. Moses didn't get to enter into the promise land, but he was God's man. God called Moses to lead the children out of Egypt. He did. And he led them right around the wilderness and all that. But he never got to go in. And they never, that first generation, never got to go into the promises that God had prepared for them. How many of you ever feel like God's got some provisions out there for you? You just can't seem to access them. You just can't see, you know God's providing, and you know God's going to take care, and you know God has more for you, but you just can't seem to find them. How do you think Moses felt after 40 years of listening to these crybabies? <laughs> How do you think Moses felt for 40 years? They walked around and did nothing but complain for 40 years. I think that's why Moses struck the rock when God said to speak to him. See, the first time God said, strike the rock and the water will come out and you'll have plenty of water. He struck the rock. Water came out. Years later, the second time, they're thirsty again. God says, speak to the rock and the water will come forth. I honestly believe that that day, God, Moses was so tired of hearing them complaining because what they didn't have and how God wasn't provided, I think he got in the flesh and struck the rock, rock not once but twice. And it was all part of God's plan because it's symbolic. Because the first time Moses struck the rock symbolizes the striking of Jesus Christ in crucifying him. The second time God said, I don't want you to strike the rock, I want you to speak to it. The second time, God said, you don't need to force anything. You just need to confess what you want. <laughs> you just need to speak the word that's inside of you, and the word will not return void. So that lesson in that is stop trying to force things to happen. Get involved, but trust God's word that he's going to come through. The word's going to return, not void, and it's going to go forth and, and prosper in what it was sent to do. So that's the lesson in the striking of the rock. But we got to get into this. So how do I ensure that I walk in these promises? Everybody say provisions. Y'all provisions. look so beautiful today, by the way. Happy Valentine. All the smiling faces. I see teeth. I see gums. This is good. <laughs> this is great. Y'all look so beautiful. That I am so glad that you're here. It's very encouraging to me. And by the way, I want to go back. For those of you on Facebook, my wife a while ago just kind of put me on the spot. And she, she just made, made everybody stand up and applaud me and all this. So it was kind of awkward. But I, I appreciate the love. I really, no, I really appreciate it. I really do. I love you guys. And it's an honor to be your pastor. It is absolutely an honor. And it's never a burden. Okay? It can be challenging, but it's never a burden. Uh, but I love you and I thank you. And I, I love my wife. Doesn't she look beautiful? My little Valentine back there. And I'll tell you, if anybody deserves any kind of recognition, it's that lady. Okay? Because she's cleaning toilets. She's working video and sound and doing so much in this ministry. She really, really does. And I couldn't do any of it. Without you, baby. I love you. Happy Valentine's Day to you too. Baby. I love you. Uh, okay, we got to get on. It's getting all mushy in here now. we got to move on. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. Let's see how we can ensure our entrance into the promises that God has already established before the foundations of the world. You know what that means? Before God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he provided everything that they would need. Before he sent you to planet Earth, he already had everything here provided yeah. that you're going to need for the entire journey of your life here. It's already here. You don't have to make it happen. Do you know that there is nothing on this earth that's ever been invented, ever been manufactured? Think about this. Out of all the technology that we have, 
All the, all the stuff you can look around in the external and see, do you know that there is nothing that wasn't already here on the planet before we ever came? See, God's not making you light bulbs. God's not, not making you iron and steel and copper and mineral. He's not making any none of that's new. It already was here before we showed up on the planet. God just gave us wisdom to be able to make and create things in this earth. Aren't you glad that He did? Just like the Garden of Eden, everything they needed was there before He put them there. Your provision always precedes your entrance. Everything you need is already there. Aren't you glad of that? If you're looking for a spouse, they're already somewhere. How am I going to find them? I heard a preacher say this years ago. This woman came to him and she's so distressed and she's just like, I've been looking for years and I've been looking for years. He said, what kind of man are you looking for? She said, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, he got to have money, tall, dark, handsome, money, all, you know, she put all this stuff. He said, well, honey, you looking for a tenth floor man and you just only a one floor woman. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> got to get yourself ready for it. If you want better, get yourself ready for better, and God will send better to you. Why God going to do that to somebody else? <laughs> oh, I better get off this. Why God want to do something like that? So God loves everybody. Why he going to send somebody, a, a one-story woman to a ten-story man? I'm buying a person. All right. Okay, I better move on. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. For who have you heard rebelled. He's talking about the children of Israel out in the wilderness, wandering around, trying to get into their promised land. This is Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 16. Who having heard, rebelled. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt? All of the Israelites who came out of bondage and slavery. Led by Moses. Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? You ever need a vacation? Amen. Oh God, hallelujah! Preaching to the thank you, Lord. We preaching to the choir. Yes, we all need those times that we need to rest. But watch. But to those who did not obey, so we see that they could not enter in because of. Unbelief. Now, I want to tell you what unbelief is. Unbelief is not non-belief. See, before I found the Lord, I was in non-belief. I just didn't believe. Unbelief is kind of like, you ever heard of the, what's that, uncola? You ever heard the cola? The uncola came out, supposed to be diet, and I don't know what that means. But anyway, <laughs> unbelief is this. I saw you part the Red Sea. I saw you, God, send manna from heaven. God, I experienced the miracle of life. God, I've seen you work and I've seen you work. But today, I don't believe it anymore. Unbelief is believe, uh, not believing something that you used to believe. See, they had no justification in not trusting God because, first of all, God brought them out of slavery. Second of all, He parted the Red Sea and killed the enemy. Third of all, he fed them when they were hungry and sent birds and sent manna from heaven. They were not justified in not believing what they used to believe because they seen it with their own eyes. Right. Has anybody ever seen God work in your life with your own eyes? Okay, don't unbelieve something that you say you believe today. When things start falling apart and life gets tough and I can't pay my bills and now there's sickness in my body and I've got stop unbelieving what you used to believe because what you used to believe will still work today. Yes, It'll still work in your life. Yeah. Stop unbelieving. Untie the things that you've already tied up and said, I believe and I trust God. Well, just keep trusting it. Yes. Just keep trusting. It worked before. God said, I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. I am not changing, so I'm just going to keep believing whether I see it or whether I don't see it. That's trust. That's faith. That's really believing. Okay. Man, we've got to hurry. We've got to get on to chapter 4. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going in. I'm going in. Listen, we're not just going to enter in to our blessings. We're going to enter in radical crazy, over-the-top, excited for what God's doing in our life. We're not just going to tiptoe in this thing and say, God, I hope you bless me today. I hope I find some favor today. I hope that you open the door for me today. Listen, when the door don't open, kick it down. 
Walk into life knowing that there's better for you on the other side and enter into those doors that fear is trying to stop you from entering into. You kick the door wide down and walk in and say, God, this is my place. You got so that I can have this kind of life and I'm entering into it. Yeah. And I'm not backing up, backing off, or laying down for anybody. I'm not giving up. I'm standing up because you're showing out and showing up. Yeah. Now that's how you're supposed to live this life. Live this thing. Let's stop being... Don't be a snowflake, okay? <laughs> Stop being so soft and so easy and so pushed around. I preached a message one time years ago, and I'll never forget this. God told me that. He said, you know the problem with the church? They want to be neutral. They want to ruffle any feathers. They don't want to make, listen, I don't want to make anybody mad. I'm trying not to make anybody. I go out of my way trying not to make people mad. You still won't make them mad. You still won't take them off. You still won't offend them because they're so easily offended. It has more to do with them than it does you. So listen, we, we, I remember this message, living in neutral. And part of that message was, it was kind of like this. Do you know why a possum is in the middle of the road? Why he's dead in the middle of the road? Because he got in the middle of the road. <laughs> That's where the traffic's at. You're going to get killed if you stand in the middle of the road. And this message that God told me to, to, to speak about living in neutral was kind of like this. And this is what he told me. If you put your car, your vehicle, and drive, try to push it. It's not easy to push. You better have some, kind, some power behind you if you're going to push your car that's in drive. Put it in reverse. Same thing. Put it in park. Try to push it. But if you put it in neutral, if you live your life in neutral, the enemy's going to push you very easily anywhere he wants to push you. You better stay engaged. You better stay engaged and stay in gear with the truth of what you know it to be and live your life in that truth because if you don't, you're going to be easily manipulated and pushed around and intimidated by the enemy of your mind. You've got to stop letting that happen. How does that happen? The first thing that happens, the first way that happens is you disconnect from the body of Christ. I'm going to preach to somebody before this day is over with. Stop disconnecting. Yeah, I hear people all the time. I have no friends. Everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. I'm going to eat some worms. Big, fat, ooey, gooey, juicy. I'm going to eat some worms. Everybody, I'm... Listen. <laughs> Stop complaining. If you don't have friends, the Bible says to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. Yeah. People disconnect all the time from ministries and relationships and then they complain. Don't unplug the vacuum cleaner and complain about the floor being dirty. Right. Stop disconnecting from people that's trying to love you and trying to help you and trying to minister to you and everybody's not. You better have some discernment and know who is and who's not because people are going to try to manipulate you and lie to you and use you and if there's people like that, definitely you need to walk away. You need to get them out of your life. I don't care if there's family members or friends. You don't want to associate with people that's going to pull you down. That's right. Amen. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, we'll skip us verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as the I'm not supposed to go on there, so I'm going to, I'm going to change gears. Uh, did, I, did I get ahead of myself? I did. How far ahead am I? Oh, okay. Let's go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 3, uh, verse 16. All this is important, y'all. I don't want to skip over too, too much of it. Okay, I'm sorry. Did I get through 16? Yeah, I did. Okay. And I got through one. Hey, I'm, I'm back on track. Just kind of jump track a little bit. I'm okay. Hebrews 14. Is that where I'm at? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Well, let's flip the page. We'll all be on the same page. <laughs> He said there's a promise of rest that remains in verse 1. Okay? I'm not really a preacher, but like my friend says, but I did sit a holiday in last night. <laughs> anyway, some of y'all get that to see the old commercials. Uh, okay, so he says that there still is a rest that remains. There's still a rest that remains. Sometimes you need to rest. Sometimes I need to rest. We all do. But there's a promise of a rest, he said, that remains. Let's look at verse 10. For he who has entered his rest 
has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from him, from his. What is he talking about? He's talking about God created. In six days, God created all the heavens and the earth and humanity and the garden. Six days. And then the Bible says, then he rested. But why? Because he was finished creating. So what is this rest that we're trying to enter into? We're trying to enter into a rest that we don't deserve because we hadn't created anything. Let's think about this and keep it in the proper context. What kind of rest are we looking to? Looking for. See, I'm looking for a beach. Mm -hmm. All right? Clear, crystal clear, white sandy beach. Bahamas. Hawaii. Oh, I listen, whatever, wherever. Wah, wah, wah. Listen, I'm looking for rest. Your rest may be different from mine. I'm looking for, and I love them. Bahamas is calling my name. Oh, my. Listen, everybody has their own vision of what rest is. But can I tell you something? Before we went on our cruise, we took six, 15 or 16 people from this ministry on a cruise a few years ago. Oh, my. Best vacation. Oh, my God. Well, some people, some people just down here embarrassed you. But anyway, no, we had a great time. It was, a, it was an awesome trip. We had set, We had the best time. We made, I mean, we jet skied in the Bahamas, and we were just snorkeling and sailboat. We had a blast. It was awesome. I'm ready to go back. Anybody ready to go back? All right, we're going to get a trip to go. Listen, I'm ready to go back, and I would love to go back. Now, that's rest to some people, but can I tell you something? I couldn't have went on that trip if I hadn't have paid for it. That's right. Mm. So the Bible says that God rested after he created something. We want to rest and not have to create. See, we just want God just to throw it out there for us. And here's you this and here's you that. Here's your new house, new job, new car, open door. But are we investing anything in it? Are we trusting God for it? And investing in it with our time, our talents, our ties, our, our gifts, whatever. We want something for nothing. That's a, listen. You can try that for your life, for the rest of your life if you want to. And you can expect something for nothing. And you may get a few crumbs here or there and it'll get you a little bit excited. Oh, you'll get that refund check. Yep, yeah, baby, I'm good to go. How long is that going to last? You're going to get that raise, but what if you lose your job? Listen, don't put your faith and your trust in a man, in a job, in money, in your bank account. Put your trust in your provider who's already said, I have given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Yeah. Well, where's it at? Maybe you're not looking at the right place. Yeah. Maybe you're not staying back. You know, Mary and I were talking about this the other day. How many times do you think you and I have gotten that close to a miracle and stopped? And turn with the other way. How many times? We were talking about this because we was riding down the road and uh, the deer were standing on the side of the road. What? Big deer. <laughs> Supper. But anyway, listen, there's a big deer standing on the side of the road. And Mary said, it's nighttime. Mary said, did you see that? And I said, yeah, I did. Just got a glimpse of it. And this is, my, this is where our conversation went from there. I said, how many times do you think that you and I have been driving down the road and a deer, right before we went around the curve, a deer had just ran out, but we missed it. Those close calls. How many times has stuff like that happened? We don't know. And I, I don't want to know how many times I've missed it. I don't want to know. That's right. What I want to know is when's the next opportunity to make it. Yes. I don't want to think about the missing it because we've all missed opportunities. Amen? We have missed them. But let's not dwell on what we've missed. Let's dwell on what we're going to get. What we're going to make. How we're going to get there. Amen? How we're going to enter into this next promotion. This next provision. This next event of God in our life. Yes. Okay. Now, I think, I'm, I think I've got to verse 10. I don't even know where I'm at. Uh, four verse 1. I'm verse 10. It's supposed to be. Do I have a 10? Does anybody have a 10? Thank you, baby. For he who has entered rest, he himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So he's talking about he ceased from creation. Verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent. Yes. And I'm not moving there. Everybody says amen. Amen. All right. That's one way to get it. Let us all, lest any 
one fall according to the same example of disobedience. He's talking about those children of Israel again. He's talking about that story where they seen God work for 40 years and never got to go into the real promises of God. For the word of God is living. Uh-oh, look at this. Powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What's he talking about? How am I going to create? He's telling you. And there is no creature hidden from its sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom you must give an account, or we must give an account. What's he saying? He's saying if you want something in life, you create it by the word just like God did. That's right. How did God create light in the beginning? God said, yes. let there be light. Bam! There was light. So God's saying His Word is powerful enough to create whatever it is you're trying to find. Yes. He creates the same way we create, by confession. Yeah. What are we confessing? What are we confessing with our mouth? What am I saying when I don't see it? Your confession should never change by based on what you see or what you don't see. Your confession should stay the same. Yes, sir. Don't ever change your confession because if you do, you may change your future. Hmm. That's why he said the word sharper. It goes forth. It does what it's supposed to do. But are we continuing to be diligent in speaking the word? Now, I don't want to just create a life. I've had enough of life. You ever feel like that? I've just had enough of life. No, I want to create an over-the-top, crazy, radical life. Yes. Where I can't help myself. <laughs> I am so excited and so full of joy and life that it's just, I mean, everything squeezes it out of me. The good, bad, ugly, and indifferent. Yeah. How do you know what's in you? You don't until it's squeezed out That's of you right. sometimes. That's right. My wife's talking about being a challenge to me a while ago. She has squeezed so much love out of me. <laughs> this is, that's what happens in life when you feel like you're being pushed and pressured and squeezed. What's coming out? You know what should come out? If you're a soda and you shake it out, and squeeze, you know what's going to come out? But if you're water, you can shake it all day long. The water of the Word never gets excited. It never gets frustrated. It never gets overwhelmed. It just... It just flows out like water flows out. Yes. And His Word is like that. The water, the washing of His Word, the Bible says, when you're full of the Word, the, all of hell can squeeze. Nothing's coming out but the Word. Yes. That's meant. What's that mean? That means I'm going to confess no matter what the squeeze is on. No matter what pressure I'm feeling. No matter what I'm feeling. No matter how anxious and fearful and, and frustrated I am. Fill yourself with the Word and nothing but the Word will come out no matter what the circumstances are saying in to you. Okay, gosh, we got to hurry. Uh, so verse 11, I think. I'm trying my best, y'all. Stay focused. Uh, let's go to 13. And there is no creature hidden from its sight. What's who? The Word. Nothing is hidden from the Word. Amen. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt like you created a mess Come on now, y'all holy, sanctified people. We all thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank y'all for your honesty. It's over here. These people are lying like dogs. Listen. <laughs> Listen. We've all created messes. We've all have, okay? There's no judgment in this place. We are honest and we're transparent. We all have created messes. How do we do that? We started confessing something. We started saying something. I'm not good enough. I'm not bad. So I start feeling insecure. So I'm going to start from looking for a relationship over here. I shouldn't. We listen. We create by our words. It starts out that way. God started that way. Creating with his words. We do the same thing. Why? Because we created his image according to his likeness. So we're created to create like God does. By speaking things. So we get in a situation in life. And the next thing you know. I don't know if I love you anymore. I don't know if I even belong in this relationship anymore. I don't even know if I like you anymore. I don't even know if I like this job. We start speaking those things, and we create a mess sometimes by just starting to do that. Now, I'm going to ask you something. If I can create something so bad in my own life that it feels literally like living in hell, you ever been there? Yes, sir. Have you ever created something that put you in such a dark place 
that you were lonely, you were depressed, you were crying, you were grieving, you were... Have you ever created something that made you feel that way in hell, living, living in a hell, so to the point that you would rather just be dead than stay in that situation? We've all been there, haven't we? Most of us have. Imagine this. And I'm not talking about something somebody else did to you. I'm talking about something that you allowed to happen in your life. Now watch this. What if we take that same kind of power and we bring it over here and I start confessing, yeah. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you think about me. I know that my God loves me. My God created me for good and for not for evil. And no weapon formed against me yeah. shall ever prosper. Yeah. Listen, when I start speaking that, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to create life and life more abundantly. Yeah. So we have a choice. Choose life or death, blessing or cursing. So we, isn't that awesome to think that God created us in such a way that we have the ability, the power within inside of us to create life, death, blessing, or cursing? Yes. Yep. That's amazing. That is amazing to me because I know it works because I've done both. That's right. I've created hell and I've created heaven in my own life. Yes. And we do that. So don't give in to the blame game. If things are falling apart, take your part in it. Own it and say, I don't want to go down that road anymore. So I'm going to get over here where life is. And you'll be like the psalmist that said, where would I be had I not seen the goodness of God in the land of the living? My goodness gracious. People see our lives. We get in situations. We know that. But people should see our lives and see us in spite of our situation. Speaking life, not death. Blessing, not cursing. That's right. Now, if you can't do that, you find yourself in a dark place. Call me. Amen. Call somebody that's going to talk you off the ledge and say, you're better than that. You're better than that. Your God's bigger than that. You don't belong there. God didn't create you for that mess. So I'm not here to push you down. I'm here to lift you out. Now let's go. <laughs> Call somebody. Surround yourself with people that's going to speak life, not death. Yeah. Because there's a world of people out there that will speak death because misery loves company. Yeah. That's right. Gloom, despair, agony on me. <laughs> oh, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. <laughs> I love that. If it weren't for bad luck, have no luck at all. Oh, gloom. <laughs> we sing that old song when we get in a situation in a pity. Mm. He Haw made that famous, but I'm going to tell you what. It's the reality. We get in a situation that we start feeling sorry for ourselves. Then we start blaming other people. Then we don't want to own it because if I own it, I have to change it. Mm -hmm. mm. Because I, to own it is to say I created it. And to create it is to say i got to change it. Mm -hmm. So, are y'all ready to change? Are y'all ready for a challenge that's going to bring change in your life? I am. I love change, but I love good change, okay? So, so let's move on. Let's finish this thing up. Uh, Hebrews 11, and I'm going I'm I'm to stay right on track, I promise you. Hebrews 11, chap, uh, chapter 11, verse 13. We're going to close with this. Uh, uh, verse 13 of 11. These all died in faith. Now that's a sad statement. Mm. Just stop there. They all died in faith. Do you know what that's saying? Do you know how many cemeteries are full of dreams and visions that never happened? Wow. They died in faith. They believed and they had faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They got right to the edge of their miracle, right to the door of their breakthrough. And then they created a theme song. Like a million miles away from me, you couldn't see how I adored you. <laughs> so close, but yet so far, my eyes adored you. They got so close, but so far away. Isn't that sad that you get that close and you start backing up? Can I tell you something? It's always darkest before the dawn. Yes. So the, the, the harder it gets, the darker it gets, the the more pressure and anxiety you feel, get ready because something is getting ready to show up in your life that God is sending in your way. Get ready for it because it's coming. 
No, it's not time to back off when it gets dark and heavy. That's the time to really press on and push forward and walk right in and enter into the promises of God. You must enter to win. And if you don't enter, you're going to keep allowing things to back you up and push you back and turn you and redirect your course. And you're going to be wondering all your life, why am I not blessed anymore? Because you didn't push through and you didn't invest and you didn't do what you needed to do to step into the promises. There is a rest that remains. But why am I looking? Why am I looking for a prize if I'm not willing to run the race? Why am I looking for a reward without a race? That doesn't even make sense. That's right. There's no reward if there's no race. That's why Paul said, I have run my race and I've kept the faith and I know that my God is going to reward me because I have been faithful. Yes. Okay. There was, here, let me finish this and I'm going to give you the three answers right quick that they had. So they seen afar off, they were assured of them. They were assured of the promised land. They embraced the promises. They confessed that, the, well, wait a minute, remember about the confession thing? So here they are, 40 years later, looking into the promised land. But they're about to die. They're not about to enter in. That's a sad, sad situation. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. So here they are. Many look. They're, they're looking at the promises. They're looking at that new job, that, that new relationship. They're looking at that open door that God has opened wide. They're looking at it. But yet they're saying, In the sweet... Bye bye. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a sweet bye bye. They, listen, we're all going to be checking out someday. They better be a sweet bye bye. But they're looking at the promises, but they turn and look at the heaven in the future and step right away from their now. Yeah. That's what he said. Look, I didn't write this. Look, he said, they, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth, but they were standing there looking at their promise. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. I'll fly away. Listen, nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all wrong with that. But I am not planning on flying away today. That's right. Okay? I am not, I'm not ready to check out. That's right. I'm ready to check in to exactly what he says belongs to me. Yes, sir. That's entering in. Now watch. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out of, Egypt, they would have had an opportunity to return. In other words, they're standing there trying to look. They're looking at the promise. They're looking at the promotion. They're looking at the, the blessing, the favor of God. They're standing here looking at it. But then they go, I just don't know. I, I just see heaven. Oh, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I can't wait. Nothing wrong with any of them. Listen. They're seeing the promises. They look to heaven and then they go this way. You know, it wasn't that bad back in Egypt. It really wasn't that bad back in the world where, where you know, at least I could pay my bills sometime. <laughs> wow. At least, you know, I wasn't as sick. I didn't feel as bad as I feel today. So they're looking at the future and they're looking in the past and everything they need is right before their eyes. Everything. And truly had they called to mind that country from which they had come out, they could have went back. That's what he's saying right here. They could have come, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Wait a minute, are they still looking at heaven? No. We've already talked about heaven. But it sounds like, well, wait a minute, they, but, but now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Wait a minute. It sounds like they're looking at heaven, then they're looking at Egypt, and now they're looking back at heaven again. <coughs> if you want to look at it that way, that's okay. But here's what God told me, Jeff. He said they looked, they seen your promises. Then they looked to a heavenly home hereafter, life after death. Then they looked back to the world, back to the Egypt. And then He said, but wait a minute. But then they looked at a heavenly place. One last scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Look at this. Here's what they see. I am so convinced that this is exactly man do I even have Ephesians in my Bible. They, this is exactly what they see 
when they were looking. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in His mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised. Everybody say raised. raised. He didn't say I'm going to raise you. That's a past tense word. And he has raised us up together. And he has made us to sit together. Where at? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here's our choices today. I can keep looking for heaven someday. Nothing wrong. I am not shaming heaven. <laughs> for God's sake. I am not shaming hereafter heaven. I'm not de demeaning it. I'm not decreeing it. Thank God for it. I am also not condemning the world and Egypt. If you want to live in the world and Egypt, that is your business. I've lived there 23 years. And I finally realized that's not getting me anywhere but craziness. Okay? I lived there for 23 years. And then I realized, wait a minute, there is a better place. I didn't die and go to heaven to get to that better place. Because I'm already raised with Jesus Christ, seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that's where I enter into my promises. Yes. Through what Christ has done for me, I get to enter into all the blessings and all the promises. And everyone, according to God, not me, is yes and amen. That's right. So be it. Now notice I did say yes and a woman. I didn't say that. <laughs> Okay, just for the record, just for the record, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep his focus here. He made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come, where we're living today, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why has He raised you with Christ? Why has He seated you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? That He might show Egypt a better kindness, a better love, a better way to live. My God, you are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are living. Why do you keep trying to go somewhere that you are already at? Oh, Jesus. That's a whole other sermon. Listen, let's stop trying to be something that we already are. And go somewhere that we're already at. Because I'm already in Christ. I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. I have been, not waiting to be. I have been made right with God in Jesus Christ. So have you. So if I'm already, we spend most of our life, unfortunately a lot of people spend most of their life trying to get right. Not even realizing that you're already right in Him. Not in your works, not in the things that you try to do and get His approval and acceptance. You are already accepted in the beloved, yes. which is Jesus Christ. How do we know that it's time to enter rest? How do you know that it's time to enter rest? Can I tell you how I know it's time to, for me to rest and enter into a rest? Because just like God... On the sixth day, God looked around at all He created, and this is what He said. And it was very good. When's the last time you woke up in the morning and said, Man, life is very good. <laughs> Man, life is so stinking very good. That's when you know that you have created a higher life, and now you can rest in His promises. But you wake up and say, wow, life is good. Not my wife is good. Life is good. <laughs> Even though she is. We wake up and we say, wow, it's the goodness of God that causes people to repent. It's the kindness, the meekness, the love of God that's inside of us that calls people to be resting and not anxious. Wow. When's the last time somebody looked at you and said, you know, you have such an or about you. Woo. <laughs> you have such an energy about you that when you just come in the room, you just I just feel the peace. I feel encouraged. That's what they ought to be saying about us. We, we shouldn't walk in a room that cause more chaos. We should walk in a room and say, peace be still. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> That's what we're here to do. 
We're here to bring that. See, you are the thermostat. Yes, that's mm. right. You set the atmosphere. Stop letting the atmosphere set you. You set the atmosphere. So do I. That's a God-given authoritative right that we have. Bow your heads with me, please, just for a moment. Man, we need to close and go. And I just want to challenge you today. Out there on social media, if you're listening, in this room today, God said, I want you to create by confessing. What are we confessing? What have we been, what will we continue to confess? Well, I confess that I'm a loser. I'm going nowhere. Life is too hard, too bad. I've done too much, too wrong. Are we going to start confessing, I've been created in the very image and the likeness of my God, my King, and my Lord. And I will stop settling for less than what He says belongs to me. I challenge you today, change your confession if you're living in something that you don't want to live in. If you're living in a place you don't want to live, stop confessing negativity and, and just missing out. That's not who you are. God created you, and then after He created you, He said, look... Now that's very good. He created you and I in such a way and then looked at us and said, that's good. And they're special. They're my special people, my special creation. Wow. Your creator says that about you. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that, Lord, we call it Valentine's Day, but you said this is the day you made. <laughs> we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I thank you today that you made every day. Now, because you've made every day, we get to create it in every day what kind of life we desire. You said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. You'll lean not to your own understanding. So, Father, thank you for the, the ability, the power, the, the uh, excitement, the encouragement, the joy that we get to create in. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to, to, to have the ability and, the, and to, to just be able to create life. Create life. The way you died to give it to us, abundantly, overflowing. Thank you that you've made us more than conquerors. There, there's no giant. There's no weapon. There's no enemy anywhere that can stand up against us because we're created in Christ. Thank you that you said that sin, even sin, has no more dominion over us. We're your kingdom people. We are been made the righteous of God in Jesus. Thank you, Father that we are established in you, and as long as we know that we're established, we're going to continue to enter in and enter in and enter in all of those things.